This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our weekly board chair check-in and update meeting. My name is Wilmarie Newton, and I will be moderating this call. In order to avoid background noise, I ask that you please mute yourself while the presenters are speaking. However, you can unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question, or you can type it into the chat box. If you're calling in from your cell phone, please take a moment to physically mute your cell phone as I'm unable to mute you unless I mute all participants. Just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be archived on CAVE's website under services. Thank you. Thank you, Will Marie, and hello to everybody. Thank you for joining us. I hope you're doing okay. We're, feels like we're in the dog days of summer, uh, but certainly that hasn't meant that uh, things have slowed down at all. Uh, such a strange year for all of us, but I hope you're keeping your spirits up and those of the and those of people around you, including our uh, superintendents, other board members, etc. Um, I want to give you a few short updates. Uh, as you know, the uh, commissioner and the governor have decided there'll be 177, not 180 days that schools have to be in session. Um, as long as there are three days at the beginning of the year uh, to build capacity to safely transition back to in-person services. Uh, the, as to what you can do with these days, certainly uh, you can have professional development. That's probably what you want to do, including on uh, social emotional learning, social, emotional intelligence, and, and how you're dealing with your uh, uh, staff and how they are going to deal with the, the kids coming back. Um, the three days can also be used to ensure all safety measures are fully implemented. So that's what I wanted to provide you with from uh, the State Department of Education today. A couple of other things. Uh, we are doing a webinar with one of our business affiliates called SLAM. Um, they are an architectural firm that does other kinds of contracting as well. Uh, this is just one opportunity um, to learn about their ways of looking at going back to school. Uh, we know there are other companies and other groups that are also coming up with plans, toolkits, and other ideas. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be on a phone call this afternoon with Connecticut Voices, who have also Ooh. set up a... We're going now. Calm down. Okay. Excuse me. Could you mute your phone, please, if you're on a phone? Okay. Uh, there are the other groups that are also coming up with uh, different ideas. We just want to make it av available to you. In no way would we let this be any kind of a selling uh, or salesmanly type of uh, discussion. There are things in their plan that are really interesting and, and you should probably think about. Uh, next, um, CABE has been working on coming up with a uh, slightly longer roles and responsibilities for board members during the COVID crisis uh, pamphlet. We do not want to make it long, but we want to be able to provide it to, to all of you and our um, members who are not board chairs. Uh, it's based on something I wrote in one of our journals about the role, as well as Massachusetts, which put out uh, a similar piece. Um, so we took the Massachusetts one, married it to mine, and now we're just making final uh, touches on it. You should know that the, also that the legislature uh, is coming in at the end of July, but they're dealing mostly with police accountability uh, the use of absentee ballots and cost controls on some drugs. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything at this point uh, education related. Uh, we, as, as well as CAPS, CAS, uh, and the teacher unions are pushing very hard for more funding because you, you folks are going to need the resources and I'll, we will certainly get to that uh, when we're talking to Fran. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is the uh, summer leadership will be taking place, but it will be done virtually on a number of days 
at the end of um, July into early August. So please watch out for that. Uh, and obviously in the next uh, few weeks, we'll have more on the convention and uh, exactly what that will be like. Uh, it's tough. Uh, it's tough planning these things when we don't know where we will be with the COVID uh, crisis, but certainly the safety and health of all of our members, uh, as well as children who might actually perform at the conference is very important to us. So what I wanna do is I wanna ask Fran one or two questions, if that's okay with her. And then um, hopefully Patrice will be back. We'll do our K board chair share. And uh, we'll hear from, uh, from what you're doing, your challenges, as well as hopefully some things that are really going well. So with that, I wanna introduce Fran Rabinowitz. Most of you already know Fran. She is the executive director of the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents. Prior to that, she was Bridgeport uh, superintendent for a number of years. Uh, also Hamden superintendent for a number of years, and she was also at the State Department of Education for a number of years. Fran is a very, very good friend of CABE, as is CAPS in general. Uh, we may not agree on everything, everything, but we, uh, we certainly work together the best we can. So with that, Fran, you still here? Yes, I'm here, Bob, and Great. thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, well, you're a good friend of ours, and uh, certainly uh, it's it's very well deserved. And I want to not ask you so much about academics yet. I'm sure our members will ask you about that. But what I really want to ask is, how are superintendents holding up? Um, we all know that uh, summer is usually a time for vacation. Um, I was supposed to be in South Africa. Patrice was going to be in Europe. Uh, those plans have been canceled, but I know that superintendents also take off time to recharge, uh, but this is a very, very different summer, and I'm just asking um, Fran how they're holding up, what board members can do so that they uh, de-stress a little bit as we head into whatever this new year will bring. Okay, thank you. Um, by the way, thank you to Cabe for um, inviting me here today. I'm really, truly honored. I see Cabe and Caps as um, um, real partners um, through thick and thin. And you're right, we may not agree on everything, but um, we're also very open when we when we don't agree and we're able to talk to each other about um, how we might make that better. So I'm I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, I would say to you that there aren't a whole lot of benefits to COVID-19, but one of the things that has um, worked well during this time for me is that you know when I'm in person and in the office, I probably get to see 10 to 15 superintendents a week on average um, because you know they come in and out for meetings or whatever. But um, consistently since March, I've been seeing about 100 a week um, because I attend all their area groups and they do the meetings um, uh, not at the same time. Um, all different times so I can be there. And it's really very helpful to me um, to know what is going on across the state, whether it's suburban, rural, or urban districts. Um, I don't have to tell you that these are incredibly challenging times. You know, we're educators, and as Bob said, yes, we do have vacation time over the summer, but I would also tell you that as a former superintendent, the summers were the times that I planned the in so much for the new school year. You know, whether that was academics or social emotional training, whatever it was, we um, spent a great deal of time in planning. 
And there were absolutes. We knew, for instance, that we were going to open schools on August 26th. We knew we were going to have two days of training. We knew that we were going to go into um, um, schools and kids would come and, you know, kindergartners would, ex would experience their very first day and so on and so forth. And right now things are very different. And so we're planning, but we're planning in an environment of ambiguity and fluidity. We know that what we plan today may not work for three weeks from now. And that is incredibly challenging for all of us who are educators as well as um, board members. Um, so I know that that is incredibly um, difficult um, for you as well. I would say to you that right now we're taking our um, the state plan and the guidelines. I know I'm not telling you anything new. I know you know the state plan and we're using that. Um, every district is using that to come up with their three plans for all in hybrid and um, all on distance learning. Um, those plans are due on the 24th um, and districts don't see that as the end. Um, that's actually to, re to meet the state requirements, but they know that they are continuing um, to modify and update their plans. Um, the resources um, that are needed, especially in the hybrid model, are huge and um, that survey is due tomorrow and I just want to again emphasize that it is very 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 important that um, uh, we ask for the additional resources that we're going to need because of COVID-19. Um, right now some of the challenges that uh, superintendents are um, dealing with and I'm I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because as board chairs, I'm I'm thinking you have a very close and good working relationship with your superintendent. And as such, you know what's going on for them. The challenges are, you know, trying to figure out how to social distance, how to get the resources they need, how to determine who's coming back in terms of families how to give comfort support to families so that they feel comfortable coming back and how to figure out um, the same with their staff. Um, and they're very worried about the number of teachers coming back, et cetera. And so that's where they are right now. And I don't think there's ever been a time, you know, I've worked with wonderful boards and I worked with a, board that wasn't so wonderful um you know it's no secret um you know i had a very difficult time in in bridgeport working with a board that wasn't supportive um and it does impede so i want to stay on the road of my hamden experience and all of my experiences since then at the state etc have always been incredibly positive and i've depended on the board greatly um, to tell me what the community was thinking um, to ask questions of um, my plans and i know superintendents are doing that as well um, and you know to sit down with you and and have you be aware of um, what we're doing and how we're moving forward so I'll stop there. I don't like to do a lot of talking. I'd rather make sure that I'm meeting your needs and um, answering your questions. That, that's great, Fran. I'll, I'll just ask you one more because it's one one of our board chairs asked. And yep. that, so what can the board do to help superintendents? They obviously maintain their uh, responsibility for oversight, but you know, this is sort of a strange situation and boards want to keep their oversight without obviously burdening the superintendent. But is there anything they could do specifically 
um, that would help their superintendent? You know, that's a great question. And I would say to you, I think that our superintendents need a vote of confidence. Um, you know, any type of a vote of confidence, um, you know, a quick text to your superintendent that says, hey, you know, we appreciate the job you're doing. We know that you're trying to meet um, the needs of this district and you're doing it in such a way that um, makes us proud. I mean, I'm only telling you to say that if you feel that. If you don't <laughs> feel it, um, you know, that's a whole different ball game that we need to deal with. But if you do feel it, I think, I can't even tell you how much that means to, um, to the superintendent. And I would also say as board chair, um, that is an incredibly powerful um, position because if you can facilitate um, the transfer of information and communication to your other board members, that is um, really helpful as well. Also, I'm just being honest here, uh, superintendents are up to their ears right now. Honestly, they are in crisis management because many of them are trying to deal with summer school, trying to get kids back um, safely, trying to get plans done, order resources, uh, et cetera. You know better than I do. So not taking a lot of their time um, would be very helpful as well. Um, I understand that you you want to know what's going on, and I am sure um, effective superintendents are letting you know what's going on because it's in their best interest for you to be the communicators out to the community. Um, and I think they they appreciate the short texts, they appreciate the short emails. Um, and they appreciate having the time to do their work. I can tell you that what I know is it, when I set up meetings with them, I mean, I listen in on their area meetings. They're never longer than an hour because they cannot, they can't take the time to do that. Um, and it, with me and any kind of professional development I set up for them or networking sessions. We're having one on marketing or communicating your plan on Monday. Um, it's never longer than 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm really understanding that they are under the gun right now. And I think that would help as well. Okay, one, one of the things that uh, we have suggested is if, if <clears throat> the board chair or the superintendent feel that too much of their time is being taken, uh, answering emails, uh, doing reports or whatever else a specific board member uh, might like, uh, since these are not uh, the regular, time, regular times, um, it's very helpful sometimes for the board chair to sort of screen what goes to the uh, superintendent, set some priorities and uh, move from there. And just let board members know that in these times when there is such strain on the system, um, it's very helpful for the superintendents to know that somebody is watching out making sure that board members are kept apprised of what's important and that the right questions are being asked. So I would just share that. Um, go ahead. I would say the same, Bob. I, I would definitely say the same. We've had to let some things sit for a while. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to do that because everything seems like a priority. But at this point in time, I think we, we really have to be very strategic in um, what we are considering as priorities. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna ask now for, for board chairs or members of our board that, um, that have questions for Fran. I, I see there are some on the web chat. Um, 
emotional, emotional and mental health. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, Fran, where we are now uh, as far yes. as planning for that? Yes, I can. Um, I can tell you that um, we're welcoming. I mean, certainly we want all of our children to get as much learning as possible, but we actually welcomed the additional three days of training. We know that our, we're going to have staff and we're going to have students that come back with um, tremendous um, social emotional needs. And we have to be ready to meet those. I will tell you that I'm working on a project with um, Mark Brackett out of Yale. Um, and I'm hopeful, I can't say a lot about it yet, but I am hopeful that we will have a program available to our educators statewide. Um, and hopefully will not cost any money, but will be modules around social and emotional learning um, for all educators um, and, and leaders throughout the state. And if this is available, it will happen and begin happening in august and continue through to the late fall um but you know i can't say more about it right now it's in its infancy stage and certainly cave will know about it um as soon as something there as soon as there is something that's tangible to know i would say to you that the social and emotional needs of kids um you know I've been working on social emotional learning now for 13 or 14 years when it wasn't in vogue um, and it it is now catching on. What I know is these are not soft skills. These are skills that every classroom teacher needs and every leader needs and we need to be able to meet the needs of the students in the classroom, we need to be able to recognize their feelings and teachers need permission to spend time on that, um, to, to understand when kids are feeling frustrated or sad or whatever, and, and have that permission to take the time. I know we have rigorous curriculum. I know we have um, pacing charts and all of that, but nothing is more important than having children feel safe and feel that they are in an environment where um, we are looking at the whole child and that that matters. Um, and to me, and I have the data that shows um, when a child feels safe, when their emotional and social development is, um, is honored, achievement is better. Um, you get a lot less chronic absenteeism you get a lot less in the area of um suspensions you know um, um referrals to the office etc so i'm i'm telling you that that needs it, it, i think that needs to be the basis of um our back to school message and i took a risk today on um on radio, on a radio interview, when I was asked, well, what about the standardized tests? And I said, you know, I've been a superintendent, test scores are always important, but they need to take a second row seat to our whole child right now and bringing in the whole child and making sure that the social emotional needs are met. We'll catch them up academically. Thank you. That's a great answer. And certainly uh, our members are very familiar with uh, Dr. Brackett and the work yep. that he's doing at the Yale Center. So uh, that's very exciting. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, Bob. We'll see what happens. Okay. If we can be of any help, you know, you always got that from us. Oh, yes. We already have you figured in there. Because <laughs> I need some social emotional help. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that, Bob. I, uh, well. I, said I said it. You know, okay. humor is not the worst thing in these times. Yes, uh, we need humor. I echo uh, those comments. <laughs> yep. We need to laugh once in a while, don't we? Absolutely. I, I watch these Zoom meetings, and if there's a laugh, it's surprising. 
And yes. uh, I love humor and, and we really need it. Um, yep. So our people are asking, we, we keep hearing on HR uh, questions and, and this one came from a few, but Deb Lowe, as you know, used to be a superintendent, now is a yep. board chair. You have any uh, suggestions how to deal with teachers who are afraid to come back to school? They might uh, have immuno uh, deficiencies or they may have uh, just believing that their age, that they are susceptible uh, to COVID. Um, what are you hearing about how many there might be and how are your who are superintendents dealing with this very tough issue? It's, um, hello, Deb Lowe. It's good <laughs> to see you on here. Um, I've known Deb for a long time. She was a wonderful superintendent. I'm sure she's a great board chair. Sure. I would say um, that that is a million dollar question. Um, right now, um, you know, nationally, the percentage um, is about 20 percent. Um, we're having a difficult time finding out what that number actually is. You know, teachers don't seem to want to tell us right now um, whether or not they're coming back. And I think they're waiting to see perhaps um, what unfolds over the next three or four weeks. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know another way other than through relationship and trust. I think that um, uh, principals are probably the best people to deal with this. Yes, we have to deal with it in human resources. I know that. But if principals and teachers can talk together and principals can assure teachers of the research it's short research, but what we know so far um, and what they are doing to um, to provide the um, for the safety and um, and health of our faculty, I think that goes a long way. I've I've spoken at length with Don Williams from CEA. I think we need to be more public about it um, in terms of how much we need our teachers and how much we're willing to do to ensure that they are um, safe and healthy. With that said, I think we also have to understand if um, teachers choose not to come back and have a doctor's note. I, I, have, I always see the cup half full. Um, so I'm looking at possibilities for um, a distance learning, you know, and perhaps for the parents who are not sending their kids back, maybe somehow or other, some teachers could be employed to do distance learning at that point. I understand, I'm over 65, I get it. You know, I think it is um, worrisome. I think if you have an immune deficiency, it is worrisome. And I think we have to accept that and I don't think we can um, resent it. With that said, um, I just got off the phone with um, Jessa Myrtle, who is the um, uh, the head of, or I guess the chief of uh, the legal bureau. And I said, honestly, you need, we need some flexibility here in our use of teachers. For example, if you have a seventh grade social studies teacher and they're certified seventh grade, but you have a need to perhaps do some remote learning with fourth and fifth graders, I think that teacher should be allowed to, to um, do that remote learning with those um, children. I'm not saying every district is gonna agree to this, but I think that it's a good way to go. And I said, you know, um, it's not something you can do last minute to get that um, freedom because it's in statute, right? And it's TRB. So there's a lot of planning that needs to go into that um, before um, it can happen. So that's a long answer to a short question. Um, and 
if need be, um, I think we have to let them go on medical leave. We have to provide FMLA. But my advice to every um, superintendent, and I think they know um, even better than I do, that relationship matters and sitting down with the teacher and talking it through is incredibly important. Well, Fran, what are you hearing from your members about what local unions are saying, those that want to, uh, in some cases, renegotiate their contracts? I'm hearing a lot about that. Um, you know, our hope was that when this began, our hope was that we could negotiate some type of MOU at the state level, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, across the board, so that every district wouldn't have to spend all of the dollars that they're spending right now for legal help. Um, but, you know, I know CAVE is helping with that. I mean, we're helping with Shipman and Goodwin. But um, I have seen some of the demands from some of the local unions, and they're fierce, to be honest with you. And I have great relationships and always have with my unions, but it's going to take a lot of, um, of negotiation. And right now, it's at every individual level. Again, I want to say to you, um, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record before this is over, but it is about relationship as well. It's about the um, the superintendent and the human resource person and the team sitting down and talking through some of these um, demands. That's that's great. Thank thank you so much for that answer. Um, are there more questions, please? If you're, you know, if your camera's on, uh, just raise your hand, or you can write in the chat box. I know we have some questions. I think we've answered most of the questions that are here. Um, certainly, our members. John, you want to ask something? I do. Hi, Fran. Good. To Hello, see, good John. To, good, good to, to see, see you. Same here. So I'm curious, this is a slightly different twist on the union question. Do you and your organization and or the superintendents have a sense of what you, what stance or what position you would take if the state teachers unions, and I would say there are two, there may be more, decide to pull the plug? Um, and we don't know if that's a possibility, but it sounds like they're being very sort of uh, careful in terms of not doing anything rash at the moment, but I believe they're biding their time and watching the developments. Do you have a sense of what you would do if that came about? What do you mean by pulling the plug? If the state teachers union said we're not allowing, we're, we're breaking the law. I understand it's illegal for teachers to strike, but we're not, uh, we're recommending that our teachers do not go back to school in this fall until xyz or whatever well both bob and i have ongoing conversations um with um cea and aft and i would tell you um they do not want that at all they do not want um distance learning for all of the um children they want to come back um, um and have their teachers back uh, just as much as we do, John. Um, but they also have members that are worried and concerned about health and safety, and they are as well. And so we've talked about together what we might do. And I've, you know, we we came to some agreement on, you know, we have to make teachers very aware that um, the state will have the PPE equipment that teachers need, that we will have um, the masks for students, that we will have the masks for staff, that we will have gowns if they're needed, that we will have the san um, sanitation um, products that are needed, that in fact, um, we will social distance to the degree that we possibly can, um, and, and I might add that in any situation that we possibly can, 
we will provide assistance to the teachers. And what I mean by that is, if possible, if the state and federal resources are there, that we can hire additional paraprofessionals to have smaller groups of kids in different parts of the building. I think that would go a long way. Um, I have not heard or been led to believe that they're gonna pull the plug. Um, you know, I may be in La La Land, I don't think so, because I'm on the phone with them um, often, and um, they know that this is a time that they wanna ensure that, they're, um, that their members are safe, but also that their members are incredibly important mm -hmm. and they don't want to go to only distance learning. Um, if I, I, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to bring all the kids back, but you know, if there's an uptick, I think we have to be reasonable and, and think about a hybrid model. Um, it, you know, the problem with, there's a lot of problems with hybrid models, as we know, you know, um, parents can't work, um, and it, you know, that's a problem for the economy in the state. Um, more importantly than that, guys, we don't have the money. We need money for that. I mean, yeah. um, hybrid models are very, very expensive. Um, and so anything that we figured out, um, I mean, we had a model that we worked on um, that was a hybrid model that was $300 million um, statewide. Um, no money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, that's what I'm hearing, John. I am not hearing a bailout. Thank you. Hey, let's, uh, uh, one of our members is asking, uh, and, and let's make this the last question. We, we appreciate you giving our, us time, um, Fran, and we certainly uh, encourage you, if you want, to stay on the call as we have our board chair share. I know Patrice okay. is, uh, at a school district today, but um, uh, actually at a school district, um, helping them with some uh, some work. So um, she will take that over, but we have a, another question. Um, what are you recommending as far as music programs um, and other activities, uh, extracurricular, if you have any kind of recommendation? Um, we know that in certain cases, because of the social distancing, this is going to be really tough. But I'm I'm wondering if you're hearing much from your members on that. Yes, I am. I you know we know that extracurricular are why some of our kids come to school, right? And we need to we need to engage them in the um, in in music, et cetera. Unfortunately, um, you know, everything that the public health department is telling us is that is the place where they can, um, where, where it's much more likely that um, COVID-19 could be um, transmitted. So we're being very careful about that. Um, there is, as I know it, um, more general music classes going on, um, not as much going on um, in person, certainly in um, in wind instruments, woodwinds, uh, plays, et cetera. I will also say that there have been incredibly innovative virtual um, um, music programs that have taken place and music lessons that have taken place virtually. So that's what I know um, right now. Thank you so much, Fran. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. And mm -hmm. I'll stay a little bit because I want to hear the um, board chair. I can stay till about uh, 10 of 12. So that, that, I'm right. anxious to hear that. Thank you very much. And thank you all for all the work you're doing. I know you're all volunteers, um, but you you are um, important people in the district. So thank you very much. And thank you. And please pass on our best to the superintendents. I, I love the idea of just people sending a short text to 
the superintendent just uh, supporting, letting them know that uh, you're thinking of the, the stress this is putting on them. So that, that's a very nice idea and I thank you for that, um, Fran. And now I see Patrice is back from her, her trip to the <laughs> southeast, southwestern part of the state. And Patrice, I'm turning this over to you to do the share. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. I'm actually outside the Darien Board of Ed office where they just had an in-person, socially distanced uh, board meeting, which included a discussion of professional development component on roles and responsibilities. Uh, and as you know, their board chair is a uh, regular participant in these board chair check-ins. I just want to do a couple of updates um, from the state level. I, I, hopefully these haven't already been covered. The State Board of Education did act this week to provide that districts can use three days of the 180 days at the beginning of the year to provide professional development to staff around health and safety, social emotional learning, as well as provide the opportunity for families to come back into the school building and become comfortable with the new protocols and procedures. So the school year could be uh, the minimum requirement is 177 days, as long as those three days are used at the beginning of the school year for those purposes. Uh, the state board did also act to endorse the governor and commissioner's reopen schools plan. They had a discussion about the importance of uh, conveying to the public that they were behind that plan and would support the, the local efforts. Um, and just so on a legal issue, the attorney general has uh, filed an appeal of the federal court decision that provides that education must continue for special needs students uh, through their 21st year and until they uh, are reach age 22. So with that, I will now see what questions, comments, uh, successes from this week that board chairs would like to share. Can you hear me, Patrice? I certainly can. Hi, Hi Eileen Baker. Hi, Fran. How are you? I don't know if Fran can hear me, but I appreciate um, Bob having her on the line. I have a question which has been ongoing um, about ventilation, about effective teaching and learning with masks, about uh, real, realistic expectations for students to keep masks on, for teachers to be able to teach effectively, and I wanted to know if that's come up among board chairs or Fran's response, and if somebody can reiterate my comments, I don't know if she can hear me. I'm not sure if Fran is still on uh, the call, so uh, do, do any board chairs want to respond? I mean, we're about educating kids and we're about providing effective teaching and learning and I think that that's essential because you know we can be on these webinars but if you're not a teacher you're not going into the classroom and that's important to be thinking about and how would that feel I mean I'm an educator and I have my own concerns about distancing schools aren't made to socially distance they're overcrowded um, and as well as I love my profession I'm just I'm questioning you know, just people on their boards about, would you go into a school? What do you, what would you need? What needs to happen to feel safe in a school? Well, certainly we know that by uh, the 24th of July, school boards will, uh, working with their administration, will have submitted to the State Department of Education what those plans are and, and what the classrooms would look like. And certainly the reopening committees in every district that we're aware of uh, do include uh, members of the, the staff of the, of the buildings. Other issues that board chairs uh, have on their minds this week. Michelle. Uh, Patrice, this is Michelle Koo. Um, I just was wondering if there's any information from the state yet about uh, 
guidelines that they will be providing or information about the health status or the the level of spread that would be in a community and what would trigger that um, the model where we would be going into uh, reduced numbers of students in schools or will they be providing information about classes or schools should be released uh, based on the the I don't know a COVID incidents within the school district. Yeah, that issue has come up uh, in our statewide partners calls, and the commissioner has assured us that that guidance will be coming out from the State Department of Public Health. That they are um, obviously trying to develop the metric uh, that is most reflective of Connecticut's health status. Uh, and so we do, and I think the last conversation indicated that it would come out in early August, but there definitely will be a state metric that guides those decisions. Can I just follow up on that? Is that, will it only be a, a community level of spread or will they be providing information about um, specific incidents within, if you have an incidence of a student within a school, do they have specific guidelines on what should happen there or is it more a community level? Guideline. I, I know they're. I know they're focusing on the community level. Uh, let us bring that question about the building level uh, back to the statewide group, as well as trying to. Um, I suspect that that your, that your public health officials may play a role in that. Thank you. Remember, please, to mute your phones <laughs> if uh, if you're on the phone. Other questions and comments? Well, we got a, another question, Patrice, that I need to get uh, about whether there'll be metrics on when and how to reopen if we have to revert back to distance learning. And I would hope that the uh, Department of Public Health would would address this in some way yeah i believe that 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 will be part of that that same metric yes so i have a question it's not Go COVID ahead, John. Related. um so we had our retreat scheduled for actually yesterday if i'm not wrong maybe even today which we then postponed because of this um sort of I don't know what to call it, an insurgence of recent college grads who were four years ago alumni from the high school making demands on intersectional curricular changes, um, all of which are kind of good, but they take on different sort of characteristics. But I wonder if other districts are having similar kinds of uh, things happen to them from grads who've come back and say to us, so we got to where we got, which is great, but we now know that what we had in high school was missing a lot, was deficient in terms of race, gender, um, and and uh, bias kinds of things, and an accurate uh, depiction of history. I wonder if other districts are getting that kind of thing from their recent grads as well. Board chairs, any responses? In Watertown, we've received um, multiple requests for review of our curriculum on everything from gender bias to um, race relations um, and culture in the, in the classroom and in the in the buildings um, they've since all joined forces together and created two groups in watertown one that is focused on our mascot change which uh, we are still the watertown indians um, so there is a, an official initiative coming from one alumni group to the board at our next meeting um, regarding that. And then the second uh, group of alumni that joined forces sent us a list of questions um, about two pages long of issues that they would like to see addressed and, and, and how they are willing to collaborate it uh, long after they go back to school. So it's been a real 
um, challenge to respond under the circumstances that superintendent and, and, and staff is under, but um, we've definitely um, are looking forward to, to working with them on it. It's, it's been, been done in a very positive way. Yeah, we, we feel that way as well. Um, the timing is the timing is obviously never going to be good for <clears throat> certainly under the circumstances. But thank you. Similarly, in Newtown, we've had um, graduates come back and bring up those issues, and it's been it's been an opportunity because they have been able to engage the district in many ways that they might not have otherwise. And so we're depending on many of our graduates to be part of the conversation. They've been brought in for um, conversations with the superintendent. We've had conversations with our local newspaper doing a broadcast where um, they interviewed several of our board members and superintendent. And so, yeah, it's been an a challenging opportunity, right. but similarly, we are we're doing the same thing in Newtown. Yeah, I think similar it's experience. Oh, go similar ahead. experience in Reading. Um, Reading Eastern Region 9 have all had similar reaction from current and former students. Uh, some Barlow High School students held a teach in last night with some experts on Zoom. It seemed to be pretty well attended. In addition, the three boards have formed a joint diversity and inclusion task force for the first time, and they're having an organizational meeting this afternoon. Wonderful. Eileen Baker, I want to thank Michelle for sending resolution on equity and diversity from Newtown. Um, I actually forwarded that to our superintendent at Nilsay Brook. I think it was really beautifully written and perhaps we can take some of those ideas, thoughts and suggestions and incorporate that because they were very well done. Okay, just, just so you know, uh, Michelle, uh, Martha and I, Dr. Brackeen, Harris and I, went to, uh, uh, by, by Zoom, we attended the, uh, the meeting of the Brookfield Board of Education. I took what you sent and turned it into a charge. I added a little, a few things on metrics at the end, uh, but that board passed it unanimously. So if anybody wants a, needs a charge to a committee, looking into equity issues, please let me know. And we thank uh, Newtown for, uh, for the work you had done in this area. Can that charge be forwarded to the listserv? I guess so, yes. Uh, there's a question as to whether any of the districts are providing COVID testing to students and faculty and how you're doing that. Just from Newtown's perspective, again, we've engaged our school-based health center to um, possibly do something like that. There's That has not been solidified yet, but that's um, something that we're exploring currently. <clears throat> For Abarica, Willington, can you hear me? Go, go ahead, Herb. You know, we, that question came up. As a matter of fact, I asked that question of our uh, some members of our uh, opening advisory committee about testing students and the staff and visitors uh, coming into the school. And they hadn't really addressed the issue and had no plans to do that. Uh, but we're meeting on August 5th, and the advisory committee is making a... Uh, presentation at that time and at that time the board will listen and either modify and ratify the uh, plan but we have three pan three plans on the, on the table at the present time uh, in opening we also have a fourth which would be closing schools in case the pandemic gets uh, more serious uh, but we're not planning testing at the present time, although I seem to feel that it it uh, is a good move just to take temperature of the students because you really can't rely on uh, parents to 
you know, if the youngster is not feeling well or in uh, things of that kind in the past, the, some of these youngsters have showed up in school. So I don't know how it's going to work out in this pandemic. There's a question as to um, whether you have given thought in your reopening plan to co-curricular activities when school begins. I know that the um, uh, there is research being done in terms of transmission for students involved in band and chorus and other co-curricular activities and ways that that might be um, done safely. Uh, to minimize the risk of transmission. Any comments from the board chairs? Patrice, it's Eileen. The question came up about ventilation. Um, it was on um, some of the chats. I had brought it up and other um, board chairs had brought it up. So I'm curious to know what that topic is because any information that you hear, you're not supposed to be in a closed setting for an extended period of time. I know the ventilation issues are a challenge in, in many of our school buildings. Does anyone want to comment on that? It's a risk factor. It's a huge risk factor. <laughs> My understanding in ER9 is that the administration has identified areas in any of our five buildings that have ventilation concerns and they might be closed off for the time being. Okay, so that's a strategy. It was also discussion today. It was also discussion today on the Today Show, which I don't usually watch, but it was a, a couple of minutes about ventilation and whether it could spread COVID. But if you're doing what you should be doing as far as filters and having a good system, um, it should not be a problem in most cases. I don't know about extended just, period of time in one place. Any final comments? How are districts managing the uh, conflicts between propping doors open for airflow and keeping doors closed for security? <laughs> Good question. Mm -hmm. Great question. That's our approach Not too. But not a lot of response. I, I think again, it's a case of you're you're attempting to mitigate risks and you're balancing um, one uh, situation against the other. All right, it is twelve o'clock. Uh, we thank you for your participation again this week, and we look forward to talking to you again next Thursday at eleven. Please be in touch with any members of the CABE staff with uh, questions, comments, or concerns between now and then. And please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you.